Hello, everybody. Welcome to this live chat with me. I've been so excited about this for so long, and I'm so glad that you can join me. We're going to be spending all oh, the next, well, if I had it my way, it would be a couple of hours, but actually, it's probably going to be about the next 45 minutes talking all things dog. Please, if you have questions, you are here live, type them in the chat. I want to hear from you, but if I don't get round to your question, don't worry, because there's going to be a lot of different questions. Some people have already sent in videos. Others will be asking questions in the live chat. And kind of, I will be giving tips on maybe not your actual individual question, but you will be able to get great information about other things as well. So I'm gonna be covering lots of different topics, but, First of all, I'm gonna introduce myself. I'm Victoria Stilwell. I'm a dog behavior expert. Some of you might know me from the TV for a training show that I do, but I'm also the creator, producer, and narrator for Dogs with Extraordinary Jobs on the Smithsonian Channel. I have to say that being on the Smithsonian Channel as a huge fan of Smithsonian everything, which started first of all when I went to the Smithsonian Museum and then got the magazine and then saw that there was a channel too. I am a huge fan of this channel because they show such amazing programming. So for Dogs with Extraordinary Jobs to be on the Smithsonian Channel is a huge honor. And I want to thank everybody at Smithsonian for believing in our show, for helping us with our show, and for making it as the global success that it is. So for you guys, if you haven't seen it yet, you better go to the Smithsonian Channel to watch Dogs with Extraordinary Jobs, okay? Um, now, why would you say, why as a dog behavior expert, would I be making television shows about dogs doing various jobs? Well, my mission, uh, our mission at Positively, which is my company, and also the Victoria Stillwell Academy. I have an academy that teaches people to become dog trainers. Uh, uh, my, uh, my mission, our mission, is to change dogs' lives positively, to make lives, dogs' lives as best as they possibly can be in our weird domestic environments. Because if you think about it, it is a little bit strange that two really major, very effective predators share the same home together, um, humans and dogs. But the relationship works. Why? Because evolution has created this incredible bond between two very adaptable species, humans and canines. And now we're using dogs in a way that, I mean, I think the sort of the world's our oyster. We can, we know dogs do such incredible things for us. And so the mission of Positively is to shine a light on how incredible dogs are. So this show is a no brainer. And I got the idea because I heard a story of a dog that detects the sonar of a particular type of dolphin down in New Zealand. And I thought that's extraordinary. And then I began to think about what other jobs do dogs do that maybe some people don't actually know about. And that's where How Dogs with Extraordinary Jobs was born, worked with Oxford Scientific Films, an amazing production company in the United Kingdom to create this wonderful show. And so, yes, we have dogs that are truly not just helping us in our homes, but saving the world through conservation efforts. So if you haven't caught the program yet, go to the Smithsonian channel and watch it. But it also, by watching it, you can also look at your own dog and go, wow, if that dog can do that, what can my dog do? And so we're sort of flipping things here for this Facebook Live. Um, we're going to talk about what you can do for the dog in your home. How extraordinary the dog that you live with is. And to me, all dogs are extraordinary. Whether they do a really important job like helping conservation efforts around the world, helping the last two white rhino, protecting them in the wild, um, to being a nanny to baboons, orphan baboons, to saving people in the lakes of Lake Garda in Italy. Uh, dogs are just extraordinary. 
even if they're just our companions, they make us feel better. And of course, throughout this pandemic, there's been a surge of dog guardianship because everybody's been getting dogs. Why? Because they just make us feel better. They make us, they're the healthier. They make us feel good and they make us socialize as well. So you know what? We're giving back to them through this. And that's why I'm really excited that you guys have sent in your questions. So some of you have sent in video questions already, but for those of you, again, please type in your questions in the live chat and hopefully we'll get to them. So without further ado, we know that throughout the pandemic, we've been with our dogs. Our dogs have been with us a lot of the time. Now, a lot of us are going back to work. We're actually traveling. I'm filming again. Uh, our dogs have got so used to us being around. What happens when we now have to go back to work? We're seeing that more and more dogs are actually getting separation anxiety. So thank you so much, Ben and Snoopy. Here we have a video question from Ben and Snoopy about separation anxiety. Hi, Victoria. This little guy here is Snoopy. He's a four month old proper spaniel. And the only thing we're really having difficulty with is separation anxiety. I live alone, so there are times where he needs to be on his own. So if I need to go buy groceries, need to shower, need to clean the flat, etc. Um, but he doesn't like being left alone at all. The whining is pretty much instantly as soon as I leave. I've tried leaving him with puzzle feeders, Kongs, enrichment toys and long lasting chews. But he solves these like that. He's very, very good at them. And when he notices I'm gone, the whining is sort of instantaneous. Um, I try them both in and out of his crate. That doesn't seem to make a difference. I'm trying to put him in stays whenever I leave the room and that gives me about a minute. So it's not really long enough to do the errands I need to do. Um, and I'm also trying to teach him how to be alone, but none of this is seeming that fruitful. So any tips would be much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Ben. And you know what? No, you're not alone. And Snoopy is just one of millions of dogs that go through um, anxiety on separation. Um, you know, our dogs are very bonded to us. And it looks like Snoopy is very bonded to you. And he's very young. He's only four months old. And so, you know, it's rather like a to toddler with a parent. Dogs are attached to us like young children are to, to the adults in their lives, to their parents. So how do we sort of start this disconnection process? Well, it actually starts before you leave. And um, I love the fact that you are leaving him with toys and activities. I love the fact that you've been doing some great training already. So good on you for doing that. But I want you to give him the activity toys and also um, do different types of games and things that he can do by himself while you're there. You see, the mistake people make is to only give the toys or the activity games when you're about to leave. And so, um, so the dog actually kind of suddenly, sometimes the toys actually become the cue that somebody's leaving. So what you do in the house when you're there is very important. And it does mean that sometimes and if you take a shower, you shut the door so the dog can't be with you. If you um, just want to go out into the garden or you want to go into another room, sometimes you shut the door. It's called independence training. And you do that while you're there. You also create a soundscape that's very similar when you leave to when you're there. Because what normally happens with separation uh, issues is that when people go out, the radio gets turned off, the television gets turned off, and the soundscape's very quiet. And then the dog hears noises that it might not have heard before. And that's actually a bit of separation anxiety that we haven't really tapped that much into. Think about what it's like when you're alone at home by yourself at night, you might hear noises that make you anxious. They've been around all day, but you haven't noticed them. And then all of a sudden now, because it's quiet, now you're noticing them. That could be another part of separation anxiety. So I want you to look at that. I want you to create a soundscape of lovely, relaxing music um, and keeping the lights on and uh, that maybe sometimes keeping the television on as long as it's not too loud. Something that the dog can make, the dog feel that it's not just so alone. The also the other thing that I would say is that um, I, I would try graduated departures so that the front door doesn't always mean you're going out for a long time. Go out and then come back in again. Go out then come back in again. Mask your cues so 
the keys don't always mean when you pick up your car keys, it doesn't always mean you're going to go out. There are various things you can do to mask your triggers and also to change the picture for your dog because dogs get very, they anticipate things a lot. So uh, if you're really worried about this though, and your dog can't settle, then, and, and get a video cam or a webcam or something so that you can see what your dog does when you are away. Cause it might mean that your dog is a little bit worried to begin with on separation, but then does settle down, record it. And if you're really worried, then I would definitely get help from a certified separation anxiety coach, separation anxiety trainer, and they can help you through because separation anxiety will not get better on its own. So even though it's happening now, tackle it now, your dog is young enough. Uh, and hopefully you will be able to see some success. So best of luck. And thank you so much for, um, for sending in your video. Okay, Trinity from Facebook asks, Hi Trinity, my dog likes to whine in the car. I've tried treats, ignoring it, other methods. Do you have any ideas? We got her checked out by the vet. Isn't anything health related? Now, I wonder why she whines. Is it because she's excited? Is it because she doesn't like being in the car? Has she ever been car sick? When you take her for a drive, does she leap into the car with excitement or do you kind of have to carry her and put her in the car? Because that really determines what you do. Now, really rather like the separation anxiety case that I just talked about, there are some dogs that have confinement issues and actually don't like being confined. So where separation anxiety, Ben had tried a crate and then not a crate, it's actually better for Sep Anx dogs not to be crated. And sometimes for dogs when they are in your car, it's better that they are just wearing a regular harness that can be belted into the seat belt um, but for other dogs, some dogs like to be confined in a crate that's partially covered. Because what I've experienced with dogs is that sometimes that excitement is just so extreme they can't contain themselves because the car ride always ends with a walk. So, or the car ride always ends by going to the vet, so that's why the dog's whining. Or you always go on a long drive so the dog gets car sick. So that's why I want, uh, I, you know, there are various different things that you can do. So try the harness, try putting your dog in a covered crate that is securely attached, um, not covered all the way. So there's still airflow, but if you do that, you might see the whining subside because the visual stimulation of so many things going past the window can be too overwhelming for some dogs. Also try some calming music. There's some wonderful calming music out there that's specially designed for dogs. Play that in the car. Because again, you know, we pay so much attention to visual and to smell with dogs. But let's think about how they hear things. So actually playing music in the car can have a really good effect. If your dog does not like driving in the car and is actually whining because of stress, what you do is that you feed your dog in the car, you give your dog wonderful toys and activities in the car while it's parked in your drive and it is not turned on. And you do that for probably about a week. And then you do that when the car's turned on, but you still don't drive it. And then if your dog is relaxed and comfortable and likes to get into the car, then you can do short little trips and start building it up. Okay. But, um, Really great question and thank you so much, Trinity, for asking it. All right, we have another video question. This is Emily and Darcy. Hi, Victoria. My senior beagle, Darcy, has never been a fan of dog toys or bones. Instead, what she really wants to do is shred and eat cardboard. Empty boxes, toilet paper rolls, paper towel rolls, you name it, she wants it. Is this safe for her to do? And if so, how much cardboard is too much cardboard? Okay, Emily. Yes. Well, you know, shredding cardboard is one thing. And that's actually okay if Darcy just shredded. I had my Labrador, who was a big shredder. She liked to she liked to disembowel stuffed toys, but she never swallowed anything. And it was actually her favorite activity. So I allowed her to do it on occasion under supervision. But the the fact is I think you said Darcy eats it too. That has me worried. So 
I want you to try something different. It's not cardboard, but beagles, they have incredible noses. And so they really like to forage. They're these wonderful things called snuffle mats. You can also make your own. You can get a pile of old toys, sorry, old towels and old rags and put them on top of each other and hide food um, in the middle of them and throughout them. And you can send your dog basically on a treasure hunt. And there's also things called, as I said, snuffle mats, which sort of do the same thing, bits of material, um, but it's really hard for dogs to tear it off. And actually it's the foraging that dogs like. So they're trying to sniff through the snuffle mat and you've hidden pieces of their kibble or some treats in it. And the great thing about these toys, because you can make kind of toys of any of anything, really. But the great thing about these is that you can use your dog's meal. You can feed your dog's meal, especially if it's kibble through these toys. And I'm a great one for that. I love not every single day. Sometimes I'll feed my dogs from a bowl, but I also like to give my dogs activity toys. So they have to find their food, they have to forage for their food, and then they can consume their food. And you know what? That's a really great way to, to, to tire your dog out. Because it's not just the, sort of the physical stimulation that's tiring, it's the mental stimulation that's tiring. So try that and best of luck. Okay. Right, Joe from Facebook. I love all of this. Keep them coming, keep them coming. Any tips for introducing two large breed dogs? One is five years old and can be reactive. The other is three and loves all dogs. Okay, well, I'm glad that the younger dog loves all dogs. Now you don't know, you don't say whether they're male or female. Normally male, female is actually sort of better introduction than male, male and female, female. But um, here's what you do. Don't introduce them on territory that they know in the front or the back garden or yard or in the home. Take them to neutral territory and allow them to discover their environment before they greet each other. Now, you're going to because most places have lead laws and it's very important to keep your dog on the leash when you can and to follow the laws. And in fact, to begin with, you need to keep both dogs on nice, relaxed leashes. One person holds one dog, the other person holds the other dog. And you allow them to sniff each other, but not close to begin with. And here's how I do it. I start by just walking the dogs. I get them walking, I get them moving, because the worst thing to do is to let the dogs greet and then just stand there because then the dogs have too much time to go, uh, I like you or I don't like you and then react. So what I like to do is get them moving, get them in the zone. And also when you're introducing them outside territory that is neutral territory, what you find is that there's so many other distractions that they're not completely 100% focused on each other. There are other sights to see, there's sounds to hear, there are things to sniff. And so this is really good. This is a really good way of kind of giving them distractions as they're greeting. So I walk them parallel to begin with. And then what I what I would do after walking them parallel for a bit at a distance, so my reactive one is not reacting, and it might be quite a large distance to begin with. And then I do what is called following. So I have the uh, the calmer dog walking in front. And then I have the other dog following behind and gradually I begin to close that distance. And what you'll find is that the reactive dog is actually picking the scent from the dog in front of it. Because we all leave a trail of scent in our wake. You'll see uh, a lot on dogs with extraordinary jobs. You'll see how how do these dogs find people um, uh, in uh, after there's been a mudslide or a collapsed building? How do they do that? And it's all about scent. Weird and gross, I know, but humans we shed about thirty to forty thousand skin cells a minute. Yeah. And that's called, they're called rafts and they sort of flow behind us like a veil. They form a cone and the dogs, what they do, you'll see when a dog's getting a scent, it'll actually kind of go back and forth like this, 
grabbing scent within that cone and as that cone and the, the dog gets closer to the person that gets a little smaller until the dog's targeted the person it's kind of a similar thing to what we do for when dogs greeting each other and then we kind of curve after we've done a good follow and our dogs are relaxed, then we sort of do a curved greeting and I call it the three second greeting. So you don't bring your dog's head on, you bring them in a curve to each other and they go, hello, for three seconds and then off they go. And if everything's all right, you do it again, maybe five seconds, but keep them moving, that's the key. Okay, good luck. All right, now we have another video question, Riley, Brady and Sadie. Hi Victoria, I'm Riley. And I'm Brady. And this is our puppy Sadie. How do we keep her from jumping up on people when she meets them? Thank you. Thank you. Wow, Riley and Brady, that is an awesome question. <laughs> and uh, again, you're not alone because lots of dogs love to jump. I had a dog called Sadie too. She is a Labrador and she is the love of my life. Um, but I love your dog and that's the most awesome name. Okay, so why do dogs jump up? They don't jump up to dominate us. They don't jump up because they're being naughty. They jump up because they're saying hello. If you think about it, a dog is obviously much shorter than we are. And it's a really effective way for the dog to get to our face to actually look us more in the eye. So that it can figure out what it what we want from it, it can figure out our communication. So the worst thing to do when a dog is jumping up is to knee it in the chest or do anything tell the dog off or even sometimes tell the dog no, because we have to understand why dogs do it. Now, sometimes dogs will jump up when they're anxious and not sure at you, and they go, hmm, I'm gonna jump up at you and take a look. Uh, I'm not too sure. Sometimes they'll do it because they're just so excited, which I think Sadie might be that. She's just so excited that she just wants to say hello. Okay, so many different reasons why dogs jump up. Here's what I did with my Sadie. My Sadie did the same thing. And so I decided, well, look, she really likes to say hello to people. So I don't want to stop that energy. She's really excitable and I love her sociability. So I don't want to stop that. However, I do want to stop her from jumping up because my daughter at the time was about your guy's age. And so I didn't want her friends coming around on play dates as well to get jumped up on either. And nor my, um, nor her grand her grandparents. So what I did is that I taught Sadie to do something different. So the energy still goes to doing an activity, but instead of going up, the energy is going down. So what I do, what I did is taught her um, to go get a toy. Um, and she loves toys, very toy orientated. So I would teach her first of all, I'd break it down. Nobody would be at the door. I wouldn't even be at the door but I'd just be there in my living room and I would throw a toy for her and I'd say, go get it. And she would go get the toy and then she would bring it back to me. And then I would throw her another toy, go get it. And so that was part of our game. Then I went to the door. After about a couple of days of doing that, a couple of days, not minutes, a couple of days, once she really understood the game, I took her to the front door and I was like, I had a toy, I was like, go get it. And so I taught her how to do that. And so now she's seeing that at the door, when I say, go get it, she goes to get her toy. And then what I did is that I had somebody ring the bell, but nobody came in because the trigger of the bell or the knocking on the door made her really excitable. But by that time, she already knew what go get it means. And so I would, again, I would, ha I would actually now have a toy down or that I'd already placed um, on the floor and say, go get it. So I had built it up to the point where the doorbell rings. I say, go get it. She goes to get her toy as I open the door. And then she comes back to say hello. And she's so excited about showing the toy. She doesn't jump up. The other thing you can do is have like a, an activity toy that you give the dog so that Sadie could have an activity toy, like a toy that's stuffed with a bit of food that she can play with. And that means her nose is going down all the time and not up. 
So there's various things you can do, but I think that's really going to help you. Okay. Best of luck. And thank you so much for that wonderful question. All right. We have Jessica Brock. Okay. Oh no, we have, sorry, Shayla from YouTube asks, how do I stop my puppy from chewing on cords and eating mulch? Mm. Puppies are like human babies. Everything goes into their mouth. They explore the world with their mouths. So this is very normal. And I'm afraid there's no sort of magic wand. It does mean you have to go around your house and you have to puppy proof your house. And here's how I do it. Okay. I lie on the ground. Yes, I do. And I see everything that a puppy could get into. And that could be stuff that's left on the ground. I don't know that I haven't cleaned up. It could be wires. It could be anything. And I block access to it. And I don't let my puppy go anywhere near these places without my continual supervision. And when I cannot be there to supervise my puppy, my puppy's in a crate or what I call a puppy proofed room area can be utility room or something. You can put a baby gate there. So your puppy's not isolated, nor your is your puppy confined in a crate. But in that utility room is the puppy's crate with the door open puppy pads, water. Uh, and that's where your puppy can be safe. So it's not chewing on cords. Now eating the mulch outside, I'm afraid again, that is supervision, you do not allow your puppy access to it. And you redirect your puppy on to things that it can chew, things that it can get. So this is why I love puzzles, special dog puzzles that your puppy can forage in and can find little treats in. So when you have those kind of toys, your dog actually will prefer so much more to go for those toys and to forage and to find the treats and little bits of kibble in those toys rather than the mulch. Okay. Good luck with that. Now I, I have a, um, a very special treat for you all because I'm going to show you how a little excerpt from the show, um, one particular family, very dear to my heart, the wonderful Xena, the warrior puppy, and Johnny. Johnny is a boy with autism. And this is a story of how a dog that was very close to death found a boy with autism and how an amazing bond developed between them. Xena was abandoned as a puppy on the side of the road. Animal services came to her rescue and were horrified by what they saw. Somehow the emaciated stray with an incredible will to live started to show signs of recovery. She was aptly named Zena, the warrior puppy. I remember mentioning her to the family. We had really all been talking about a Labrador retriever and I had fallen in love with the lab. Linda wanted to save Zena, but there was a problem. Johnny disliked anything new invading his personal space, and that included dogs. But as they collected Zena, something remarkable happened. Zena crawled onto Johnny's lap. Are you ready to go? And stayed yes. there. She's ready. Which was a miracle in itself. Right, because of all the space issues that he has. She has lots of teeth. She does have lots of teeth. I just was, I, I was in tears. You got a new puppy? Find a new place? You got it from the news? From that moment on, life changed for Zena, Johnny, and the rest of the Hickey family. After Zena's arrival, Johnny was suddenly happy to touch food without it being a problem. Sheep. And there were even more changes in store. Cook, sent in. 
Our home was a silent home, silent. You know, he would play independently, no talking, no singing, no giggling, no nothing. It was a completely quiet home. High five, Tina. <laughs> come on, Tina, come on. And um, we're in the family room when we first came in. <laughs> it was giggling and laughter, and I'm like, this is unbelievable. Good girl. It's thought autistic children respond well to dogs because they don't feel pressured by them. Dogs don't judge. They simply calm and comfort. My name is Johnny, and this is my puppy, Zena. I think we make a pretty, perfect team. Isn't that incredible? That is just an example of one of the amazing stories we filmed for Dogs with Extraordinary Jobs. There are 20 stories like that. Truly extraordinary dogs doing extraordinary things. Now, the update on Johnny is he's 14 years old now. He's doing really well at school. Zena is still his love. He, ha he is a different child. He is very verbal. He is hugging people. He can touch and eat a lot of different foods, which before Zena was there, he could not do. And he has a pet lizard now that he takes to school with him. He is doing amazingly well. And it's all because of Zena. It's she's an incredibly special dog. And because she is a pit bull mix, you know, Johnny realizes as well that, you know, he's different. Zena's also different. Some people will discriminate against dogs like Zena, like they do him. And so this bond has just been remarkable. And so he's doing really well. And I just wanted to let you know and give you an update on that. Okay. So let's, well, thank you so much. We have so many questions, but I hope that you're finding it useful even if I don't get to your questions. So we've got Shelly from Facebook. How do I help a dog that barks at himself in the mirror? I'm at a loss. Oh, yes, yes. Okay, so sorry. <laughs> so they did loads of studies and um, do dogs recognize themselves in the mirror or not? And, and, and do other animals recognize themselves in the mirror? Well, actually, what they did is um, they've done studies where they sort of put like a paper dot on the a chimpanzee's head or on the dolphin's head. And um, when the chimpanzee or the gorilla looks into the mirror, it looks in the mirror and then suddenly goes like that, exactly like we would do if something odd was there. So researchers saw that actually what the uh, the gorilla or the chimpanzee was looking at was recognizing that they were looking at an image of themselves. Same with the dolphins, I have to say. Dogs? Mm, no, not so much. Gosh, darn it. They're very smart, but you know, dogs can't do everything. <laughs> and so, uh, no, apart from maybe the odd feeling of something on your forehead, no, they don't recognize themselves in the mirror, which is why your dog probably be, is looking at the mirror and going, who's that? Who's that? So the only way that you can really stop that behavior and so many different behaviors, and this is sort of general for everybody listening, um, we call it management, is how, do I, how can I most effectively, the, as quick as possible and as easily as possible, how can I stop this behavior from happening? How can I set my dog up for, for success? And really what it is, is that you manage your environment. So you don't allow your dog to practice that behavior. That means either putting your mirrors up, it means covering a mirror. And so when you find that a dog doesn't rehearse a behavior, then the behavior goes into extinction, but you have to keep up it yeah you have to keep at it so manage your environment to set your dog up for success but um no wonder you're at a loss because it is a really difficult behavior what i normally do is that if i can't remove the mirror then and if i can't cover it up um i'll either get a good recall so recall the dog away from the mirror um i will stop the dog going into the room where the mirror is at 
um, and I will try and give the dog other activities so that it actually is not really bothered by seeing itself in the mirror. But sometimes it can be freaky. So management is going to be your best friend here. Okay. Right now we have another video question. This is Ife and Donald. Hi, my name is Ife and this is my dog Donald. And my question for Victoria is how do I get my dog to calmly approach other dogs? Because sometimes he gets super excited and super friendly when he sees other dogs out on walks. Thank you so much for that. Okay. <laughs> I love it that he gets excited, but look, Let's think of it from the dog's point of view. And I love doing that as well. It's a really not, a, a, a really good tip. Try and see the world from your dog's point of view. Like I was talking about from a puppy's point of view, that means get down on the ground and see what the world is like. If you have a little dog, do the same. Get down on the ground and see what the world is like. It's all legs, table legs, chair legs, people's legs. It's weird. So I also look from a dog's point of view of what that leash is so for us the leash is very important it is our canine life preserver it's going to keep our dogs safe keep our dog attached to us and there are laws that we have to obey to keep our dogs safe and to keep people safe but if we look at the leash from the dog's point of view what is this annoying piece of rope stopping my ability to act naturally so dogs get frustrated they get really frustrated at the other end of that leash because they can't just go up and say hello they can't put distance between themselves if they need to. And that's why you'll get dogs that are really excitable and dogs that get really reactive because it's just frustration and agitation. So what do you do? Well, most places, unless it's a nice and safe off leash area, we can't walk our, dog, our dogs off the leash. Some people with really reactive dogs, as in they don't like other dogs, will walk their dogs in areas where there aren't a lot of dogs. And um, they will employ things like emergency U-turns that they teach the dog inside the house first, which is basically, hey, turn around, we're going in this direction, if they're outside and they see another dog. Um, so we don't want to stop that exuberance, but excitable greeting can also cause other dogs to maybe feel a little bit odd. What is this crazy animal in front of me? So what I do is I just sort of do the reverse direction. And um, I might play a few games, I might have a tug toy, I might um, throw a few treats on the ground, I call it scatter feeding. So I'll get a few treats and I'll throw it on the ground and I'll say go find. And I'm giving my dogs other activities, other things to do as we're approaching the other dog. Um, and I might have already taught the dog to touch my hand and I say touch, move the dog away, good, now we can walk forward. So basically what, it, what I'm doing is that when the dog is really excitable, when the dog is really either excited because they're excited or frustrated or nervous, is that I'm actually engaging the brain in another activity. When a dog's thinking, it's less emotional. Think about a time when you've been really, really excitable or really nervy or angry or really frustrated. Sometimes it's really hard to learn. And that's because our sort of emotional brain takes over our thinking brain. That's why it's really good for people to start thinking. So for example, I was on a flight flying into Portland about 18 months ago, just before the pandemic. And it was really bumpy. The pilot warned us, but it was really bumpy. And the plane was going like this. And I'm not the most, I'm not the best flyer, but I'm not completely nervous. But I was nervous on this one. So what did I do? I knew that sort of brain relationship. And I thought I'm gonna write. So I started writing and writing and writing and writing an article because I write various articles for various magazines. And I, I just wrote and engaging my thinking brain calmed me down. This is exactly what we do with dogs that are reactive on the lead. We give them things to do. So now they're thinking, thinking, thinking rather than hello or get away. Do you see what I mean? You're engaging that thinking brain. And as you're doing that, it brings the dog's frustration down. And so that's what I do games and little activities as we're getting and approaching the other dog. And you can approach when you're calm. 
right? If you're wearing crazy behavior, no, you can't. But you're going to calm down and approach. And I do setups. Unfortunately, I have lots of friends with calm dogs. So if I have a reactive dog in any kind of way, I will use those calm, dog, those calm dogs to do that technique. Anyway, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful question. And good luck with that. All right. Lynn from Facebook asks, I am a home boarder and one of my boarders has decided I'm her resource. Oh, that one. Ooh. How do I treat her to get her to understand I'm here for all the dogs? She's guarding me in the house and stopping them from approaching some of the time. She's nervous, yes, and initially really missed her owner. Now I am her valuable resource. Okay, hmm. I see this a lot, and I see this a lot with dogs in boarding situations, doggy daycare, things like that. Um, when they gravitate and anchor themselves to the human person, to, to the human person, to the person, and it could be somebody that they don't really know that well, but it's a person, when they anchor themselves to that person, it's not necessarily that they are guarding the resource. It can be that don't come near me um, and I'm next to my anchor for protection. So sometimes dogs don't do well in boarding situations, nor do they do well in doggy daycare. And when I have a dog that does exactly what this dog is doing, I will first of all look and see whether this is the best situation for this dog. Because A, it's not good for this dog. B, it's not good for the other dogs and it could be a liability. So um, if you can separate with a system of baby gates, it's all about safety. And I feel like because this dog is nervous and let's say you're like, no, but I still want to board this dog. This dog still got, needs to be boarded with me. So I want you to create what I call a safe space. And this is where the dog goes to. If there is another dog that it likes to play with, or it can come out at various times for playtime with one or two other dogs, great. Otherwise, this dog can just chill out in its safe space. And you give it, um, and it can still see you because it's behind a baby gate. And it still knows you're there, but it's safe from the other dogs. And you give it activity do uh, toys to, to play with throughout the day. Um, and I think if you do that, then the dog's not going to need to guard you. The dog's not going to need to sort of Velcro itself to you. Um, and it's going to be much more relaxed. So try that. But I think it's a really great question because it does happen a lot. So when I have dogs that are nervous and I know that they go to doggy daycare, I'm always like, hmm, can I see a video of the dog at doggy daycare? And invariably the dog doesn't go to doggy daycare again, or it goes to doggy daycare, but in a safe area where it feels safe and much calmer. Okay, we have another video question. This is Carolyn and Minnie. Hi, my name is Carolyn and this is Minnie. Um, we have a question about how to get Minnie used to her harness. She seems to prefer her collar and anytime we take her harness out, she hides from it. Um, we, we're not sure what to do. We've tried many different things we've, with her. We've uh, fed her her meals with her harness on. We act really happy when she's wearing it. And um, we, we give her treats when she's wearing it. And as you can see, she's very treat motivated um we're just not sure what to do she's fine when she's walking in it but she's just very you can tell she's upset when we take it out and try to put it on her and sometimes she'll run around the apartment and um sort of try to brush it off and we're not sure what to do because we'd prefer to walk her in her harness but she seems to prefer her collar any advice is appreciated thank you so much say bye Mimi. thank you so Carolyn, thank you so much for sending that in. Um, okay, again, this is quite a common issue. I do prefer putting harnesses on dogs, small dogs, large dogs. It doesn't matter because the neck is a very vulnerable area, which is why, please, please, please do not use a choke collar or a prong collar or even a shock collar to walk slash train your dog. Please, please, please don't do it. So I understand, Carolyn, why you would like to use a harness more. If you look at the dog's neck, you've got the thyroid gland at the base of the neck, you've got the salivary glands, you've got the trachea, you've got very, very vulnerable areas which can become damaged if any 
any pressure is put on that neck at all. It's the same sort of thing if you were to wear something around your neck that constricted as you walked. Now, for dogs that don't pull on a walk, attaching a leash to a regular collar is absolutely fine. So if Minnie doesn't pull, I don't see there's any reason why she needs to wear a harness. But if Minnie pulls, The harness does feel, can feel odd when it's first put on. So there might be various different harnesses you have to try. And sometimes it's dogs don't like harnesses going over the head. Dogs don't like putting their foot through harnesses. Dogs uh, don't like the feeling of the harness under their armpits or it's constricting around their middle. And that's why, yes, Minnie is trying to sort of brush it off. Um, and try and rub it on things. It's just not that comfortable. I would say try different harnesses. There are there are harnesses that are much, much softer. Um, and uh, I can't say brands, but there are a lot uh, that are um, genuinely, it's kind of almost like wearing a wrist, wristwatch where you you know it's on there to begin with, and then you just forget it's there. And I actually really like what you're doing is that you're feeding her around the harness. You're, um, you know, you're making the harness a positive thing. Don't go too over the top when the harness is on. I, I actually make it a bit sort of, oh, it's just no big deal. All right, the harness is on. The mistake people make is to put the harness on and take the dog for a walk straight away. Let, the, let her wear a harness just around for a bit. Make it no big deal. Feed her her meal. Do something else. Go watch TV. Don't make it a big deal. And then take it off her again. Put it on her again. Take it off her again. And do this for a couple of days and then attach the lead to it and take her out for a walk. Just a short walk to begin with and see how she is with that. I think if you build it up like that, I think that um, I think you're going to see some really good improvement and that she will forget that it's on. The other question that I actually get is, can I use a head halter on my horse, on my horse, on my dog? Um, And the reason why I said horse is because halters are normally used for horses. It's easier to control them. And for very large dogs, some people like to use the head halter. I used to use them, but I'm not a big fan. I'm not a big fan because again, it rubs a lot around the face and up by the eyes. And sometimes, um, but sometimes people with very large, very strong dogs prefer to use them. And again, it's all about what is safe. What is safe for the dog? What is safe for the person? So thank you so much for your question and good luck. All right, we've got Joy from Facebook. She says, I have a three-year-old rescue greyhound called Fifi. She likes to dig at our fluffy bedroom carpet religiously before bedtime, before sitting down. She seems to really enjoy it, although it's causing mayhem. How do I stop her from doing this? Telling her off doesn't seem to work. She has about 40 toys, but it still doesn't stop her help. Okay, you make your bed, don't you? Well, like my 17 year old, she doesn't and I have to, I have to make her make her bed. But dogs like to make their beds too. And so it's a very doggy thing to do to either when they're outside to scratch at the dirt, or when they have got a bed to actually lie on to scratch at the bed, turn around a couple of times before they plot themselves down. And I think that's what she's doing. So I'd like you to try this. Get kind of nice, um, I mean, to accommodate a greyhound. And you can just go to the carpet store and you can get sections. You don't have to buy anything. You can get sections of discarded, nice sort of shag pile carpet and just put it in your room. And that might be her place that she likes to dig into because toys aren't going to work. That's not what she wants. She wants to make a comfortable bed. And sometimes as well, people think that actually scraping on the ground before a dog lies down is actually releasing the scent from the dog's paws. Now, a dog's paws are the only place where they actually sweat. A dog can only cool themselves down, thermoregulate, by a panting. But, and the only place they sweat is through their pads. But also on these pads as well, you have a lot of glands that have the dog's scent. So have you seen it that when your dog goes to the toilet, especially outside, hopefully it should always be outside, um, that they might scrape 
their at least their back paws along the ground. And what they're doing is actually distributing their scent on the ground and then lifting their scent off into the air to cover a wide area. It's almost like it is like P male, but it's almost sort of, you know, it's kind of like a, a Facebook or a, I was here. Here's lots of information about me because all of this, um, all of these, the scent carries a lot of information about the dog that was there. So they think that when dogs lie down, they do exactly the same thing. So the scraping is not just making, even though if there's not a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff to make a bed, it's still making a bed, but it's also distributing scent. So try that, try different kinds of fluffy towels, things like that. And then you'll have a dog that's doing it on the fluffy towel or on the carpet bit that you get from a carpet store and not on your carpet. But toys, don't tell her off because it's a normal, natural dog behavior. It's something that she likes doing and needs to do. Okay, we have final question. How can I tell the difference in different types of tail wags? How do I read happy, anxious, predatory tail? Oh gosh, I love that question. Thank you so much. Okay. This is a reason why I don't like tail docking because tails are so expressive. So much of our dog's body language conveys um, intent and conveys their emotional state. So when a dog is happy, they usually wag their tail in a helicopter, circular motion, but they can also wag their tail really fast. But dogs that are nervy, can also wag their tails very fast. Dogs that are predatory can also wag their tails very fast. So how do you know which one it is? You look at the rest of the body. In my academy, we teach all of our trainers to be incredible observers of body language, as well as vocal language, but dogs don't speak our language. And that's where problems can happen because it's really hard to understand their language and it's really hard for them to understand our language. So we try as best as we can to understand what different body language or body signals mean. So when I look at a tail, I'm also looking at what the rest of the dog's body is doing, including the head. What's the expression on the dog's face? Is it tense? Are the eyes staring? Are the pupils dilated? Are the ears tense and forward? Or are the ears relaxed? Is the mouth open? Is the dog slightly panting? Is the tongue hanging out? Is the body fluid and moving like that? Now, if I've got a really waggy tail, I know the dog is happy. If I see that the dog is wagging its tail, but the rest of the body is very tense, then I know that there's something up. And also what we teach our students is to not put labels on our dogs right from the word go. Oh, my dog's happy. Oh, my dog's this. We will eventually use a label. But what I want you to do is first of all, observe what the dog is doing. And here's how you do it. Tail is wagging in a circular motion. The body is very fluid. The dog's mouth is open. The tongue is hanging out and relaxed. The eyes are blinking. The ears are slightly back, but relaxed. Now I might be able to say that my dog is happy, feeling good. If I see my dog is leaning forward, very tense, mouth is closed, tail is quivering, then I might be able to say, hmm, my dog looks like it's maybe a bit nervous or it might be getting ready to do something. And then if I see a dog that's just going crazy and jumping around and is really excitable, I might say, that dog is excited. But again, I look at body language first and then I put a label to it. Okay, this has been, this has been probably one of the best Facebook Lives I've ever done. I have really enjoyed it and I hope that you found lots of information. Um, remember, please do watch Dogs With Extraordinary Jobs on the Smithsonian channel. Thank you everybody that sent in videos. Thank you everybody that's joined uh, us live. And thank you again to Oxford Scientific Films, to all of those people who took part in Dogs with Extraordinary Jobs and to the wonderful folks at the Smithsonian Channel who made this Facebook Live possible. Thank you so much and um, have fun with your, with your dog and don't forget to watch the show. Take care everybody.